Black body radiation is the thermal electromagnetic radiation within a body in thermodynamic equilibrium with its environment. In a dark room, a black body at room temperature appears black because most of the energy it radiates is in the infrared spectrum and cannot be detected by the human eye. When the temperature of the object is increased to the lowest faintly visible temperature, it will appear as grey, even though its collective physical spectrum peak is in the infrared range. We cannot perceive colour at low light levels. When the object becomes a little hotter, it appears dull red. As the temperature increases further, it becomes red, then orange, yellow, white, and ultimately blue-white. Although planets and stars are neither in equilibrium with their surroundings, nor perfect black bodies, black body radiation is used as the first approximation for the energy they emit. So with this in mind, let's examine if a plasma is capable of producing a black body emission spectrum. Arc discharge lamps produce light by an electric arc. An arc is the discharge that occurs when a gas is ionised. It initially requires a high voltage to ignite the arc. After this, the arc can be maintained at a lower voltage. So do these arc lights produce a black body spectrum? Well, interestingly, this is exactly what a piece of research from 1953 on behalf of the US Naval Radiological Defence Laboratory was interested in finding out. Now, before we examine this research, we must define a term that they will use, the angstrom. It is a unit of length equal to 0.1 nanometers and is primarily used to measure the wavelength of light. Visible light goes from 4,000 angstroms to 7,000 angstroms. The US Naval Radiological Defense Laboratory employs high-intensity Navy searchlights with two 36-inch paraboloid reflectors for studies of the effect of thermal radiation on materials. The center of the focused image of these carbon arc discharge lights was determined to be in the region of 3,000 to 9,000 angstroms. They wanted to measure the spectral intensity distribution of the setup, but this presented serious difficulties due to the high intensity and the convergence of the beams at the focus. This was about 5,000 times that of the normal noon sunlight. On top of this, they wanted to use longer exposures to average out short-term fluctuations in the arc intensity. All of these meant that their equipment would have to withstand about 1 million times the intensity compared to normal spectroscopic measurements. In order to solve this, they determined that they could use a magnesium oxide smoke plate to reflect the light off. This would allow them to sample each wavelength interval of interest and to plot the photographic characteristic curve for the light reflected by the magnesium oxide smoke plate. In order to ensure that this plate was not interfering with their results, they then removed the plate and took two comparison spectra. The geometry of the observing system remained unchanged. They initially encountered some additional lines created by cyanogen due to the carbon electrode and the presence of nitrogen in the air. So they repeated the experiment by using the arc discharge in a carbon dioxide atmosphere rather than air and eliminated these completely. In fact, what they saw was that the emissions when done in an atmosphere of carbon dioxide was that of black body at 3860 Kelvin. They then investigated the possibility that the reflectivity of the magnesium oxide smoke plate would change as a result of irradiation. They concluded that the reflectance of the magnesium oxide smoke plate was not significantly changed by six minutes of irradiation. Now, this is only observing one arc discharge. So what happens when we examine plasma filaments and the light they emit? Now, you should all be familiar with Anthony Pratt. He is an American plasma physicist who worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, where they conducted experiments examining plasma in great depth. He also worked together with Hannes Alfane, who you should also be familiar with. In Peratt's The Physics of the Plasma Universe book, he has a section looking at the transport of cosmic radiation. Within this, there is a chapter devoted to blackbody radiation. He starts by showing the Planck radiation law curves and discussing both Planck's formula and Stefan's law for the total brightness of a blackbody. 
He then discusses the theory of spontaneous and stimulated emissions, and works through the equations to show that these are also a form of Kirchhoff's law for anisotropic non-thermal plasma. This showed that when the particle distribution is Maxwellian, and this basically means that the particles do not all have the same speed, but their speed distribution follows a graph shape that looks as follows. So when the particle distribution follows this, the plasma emissions will be equivalent to a vacuum black body intensity of a temperature T. Here it is important to realise that the temperature here refers to that of the emitting electrons. Neither the energy nor the distribution function of any other species of plasma particles enters into the equation. For tenuous plasmas, the equation reduces to what is generally considered to be the classic form of Kirchhoff's law. What is important to realise is that by analogy with vacuum black body radiation, the temperature we measure from this is not a true temperature, but instead a fictitious one and depends on the particle distribution, the frequency observed and the direction of propagation. Cosmic plasma is often filamentary, caused by the electrical currents it conducts. These currents are the source of synchrotron radiation, and it is therefore important to determine the absorption caused by the filaments themselves. When we examine the spectrum of the radiation emitted by a plasma with an electron temperature of 30 kiloelectron volts and include self-absorption, it looks as follows. Any individual filament would therefore not produce a profile which looked like black body radiation according to this, but when we start to consider multiple filaments, the effect of all of these filaments added together starts to approach that of a black body spectrum. So how many filaments would it take? In this graph we can see the number of filaments plotted against the magnetic field required to produce a black body spectrum. For context this would mean that we would require about 1 million filaments to produce a black body spectrum at the surface of the sun. Synchrotron radiation produces polarised light, and yet the light we see from the sun and other cosmic sources tends not to be polarised. Here, Peratt has also addressed this concern. He points out that often magnetic fields in cosmic plasmas are ordered on a global scale. Nevertheless, cosmic magnetic fields often present tangled, almost random appearances on the scale of interest in synchrotron radiation. A laboratory plasma where the current filament generally flows in a preferred direction, but flares, twists and kinks to produce a total magnetic field which, for all practical purposes, is random. The assumption is therefore that the field lines are essentially uniform on the scale length which is large with respect to the radiating electron gyration radius, but randomly distributed on scales which are small compared to the size of the filament itself. This means that the sum of all of these random polarizations will tend to create a profile which is non-polarized. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.